Frequently on my channel, I see comments like this. So let's look at how Muslims come to the popular conclusion that Rebecca was three years old when Isaac married her. This is from Discover the Truth. I've annotated their assumptions in red. Some facts on what we have so far, skipping down to number three. The incident on Mount Moriah and the birth of Rebecca happened at the same time, assumption, when Isaac was about 36 years old, assumption, same time when Sarah died, assumption. The verses all looked together tells us that Isaac was 37 years old when Rebecca was born. Assumption carried forward. Now we're going to talk about what the data actually say. Let's look at the first assumption. The incident on Mount Moriah, Genesis 22, and the birth of Rebecca happened at the same time. The only temporal indicators we're given in the biblical text are the phrases, after these things. But as commentators rightly note, this phrase is simply to situate a pericope into the larger context. It's also used as a general indication of when an incident took place, and it has an indefinite connection with foregoing events. The phrase simply doesn't give us a specific indication of time, but let's look at how Muslims want to read Genesis 22 and 23. We can have some fun with this. Now, immediately after these things, that is the binding of Isaac and Abraham and his men going to Beersheba, it was immediately told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah has borne several children to your brother, Nahor, in immediate succession. And then it names the children, and Bethuel immediately fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and Abraham got word of this immediately after it happened. And Sarah died immediately after, when she was 127 years old. This understanding has no basis in the text whatsoever. Additionally, the theory that the phrase, after these things, means that the events happened immediately after each other is self-defeating, because back in Genesis 21, Isaac is weaned. So he's about three years old. Genesis 22 is the binding of Isaac. What joins Genesis 21 and Genesis 22? The same phrase, after these things which, according to Muslim logic, must mean Genesis 22 immediately follows Genesis 21 chronologically, which would make Isaac about three years old in Genesis 22 as well. However, this conflicts with the assumption we saw earlier that says Isaac was about 36. So now Muslims have to tell us why the phrase, after these things, does not mean immediately at the beginning of Genesis 22, but it does at the end. Otherwise, they're just being inconsistent. Now, according to rabbinic tradition, Sarah does die in Genesis 23 immediately following the events in Genesis 22. This is because some Jewish sources describe Satan telling Sarah that Abraham actually sacrificed Isaac, so she died from a broken heart. Indeed, our Muslim author supports much of his argument with what the rabbis read into the text. How do we know that all this happened simultaneously? From the word came at the beginning of Genesis 23, this verse shows that Abraham was absent when Sarah died. From where did he come, according to Genesis Rabbah? From Mount Moriah. The rabbis simply read something into the text that's not there. But of course, this suits the Muslim author's purpose, so he uses it uncritically. Now, Muslims, I know your God and your prophet love rabbinic legend and folklore, and included it all over the place in the Quran and Hadith. But if you follow this channel, we actually talk a lot about how the rabbis read things into the text that are not there. We've talked about this in great detail in several videos, going right back to the Hebrew text. However, I would encourage you to focus on what the biblical text actually says, instead of reading it through the lens of rabbinic legend. Now, the author defeats his own argument again. In a follow-up article, he gives a couple definitions of a word used for Rebecca, na'ar, or the feminine form na'ara. Here's one of them with infant in all caps. Since he's using the masculine form, you see boy as a possible definition as well. He says, we have seen that the word na'ar further complements the previous articles by describing Rebecca as being a child, just before she was married off to Isaac. You would think at this point it would occur to the author to say, Hmm, I wonder what word is used to describe Isaac in Genesis 22, where I'm trying to argue that he's 36 years old. I better check that before I post this article. Nope. Abraham said to his young men, and that's Na'ar in the plural form, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy, Na'ar, will go over there and worship. But remember, according to the definitions used by our Muslim author, Na'ar means boy or child. So this guy wants to argue for that definition with Rebecca, but then still argue 
that Isaac was 36 to 37 years old on Mount Moriah, when the same word is used to describe both. The author has defeated his own argument again. So far, we've shown that the chronology that Muslims want to assume is unwarranted, based in part on Jewish legend and self-defeating. We've also seen that the Hebrew word used for Isaac describes him as a youth, and this is generally indicated by him being weaned in the previous chapter as well. I initially said these were assumptions, now I've proven them to be so, and very bad assumptions at that. Ah yes, but Rebecca had a nurse. Rebecca's young age is alluded to, typo, in Genesis 24, 57 through 59, but then he quotes 57 through 60. The following verse, typo, corroborates Eric carried forward with previous evidences, typo, shown typo, that Rebecca was a very young girl when she got married. She was so young that she needed a nursing woman with her when she was married off. In order for this argument to be valid, it must be necessarily true that the mention of Rebecca's nurse means that she was so young that she needed a nursing woman with her. So, let's test this theory. Rebecca was sent away with her nurse in Genesis 24, and 11 chapters later, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. So if the mention of Rebecca's nurse means she necessarily had to have a nurse with her, then that means that the age of Rebecca didn't change much from chapters 24 to 35. We can even add to this absurdity. In Genesis 25, Rebecca had Jacob and Esau. This is obviously between the mentions of her nurse in Genesis 24 and 35. So even after having children, Rebecca still needed her nurse. You get the point. Apparently, the mention of Rebecca's nurse doesn't give us any indication about her age. Why is that? On Genesis 24:59, Sarna comments, Hebrew meneket is really a wet nurse. Rebecca could hardly have been in need of such services. In Mesopotamia, the wet nurse frequently had the additional duties of a tarbatum, bringing up the child and acting as a guardian. The Akkadian word tarbatum seems similar to what we might call a tutor. It's easy to see that Deborah's responsibilities would change as Rebecca got older since she stayed with the family. The title nurse is clearly a remnant of her former job description, recalling, of course, Deborah's earlier days with Rebecca. She was obviously a very important member of the family since her name and death are both recorded, as is her legacy title, nurse, which stayed with her until the day she died. Now, related to this, we have several words Muslims would love to have in the Hebrew text, but they're missing from Rebecca's description. The words yonek and ul are both words in Biblical Hebrew that describe a nursing child. There are some examples for you. There are also other words and modifiers, like katon, which would be small, that would indicate Rebecca was a child. Once again, unfortunately for Muslims, those words do not occur in the text. So, what can we say about Isaac and Rebecca from the text itself? As we heard from the self-defeating argument earlier, the term used of Isaac, na'ar, can mean boy or youth, though the Muslim website we've been referencing only wants to apply that definition to Rebecca and ignore or miss the fact that the same term describes Isaac. A natural reading of the text implies that Isaac was indeed a young lad and certainly not in his 30s. Remember, he was just weaned in the prior chapter in Genesis 21, and it seems unlikely that 30-something years would have passed between Genesis 21 and Genesis 22. Sarna notes that Isaac was about three years old when Ishmael was expelled. He is now, in Genesis 22, old enough to carry a load of firewood and to ask an intelligent question based on experience and observation. It's noteworthy that modern Jewish commentators, like Nahum Sarna, do not follow in the rabbi's footsteps on the interpretation of Isaac and Rebekah's age. Rabbinic legend doesn't work too well in modern scholarship. Turning to Rebecca, several terms are used for her, and we need to take those into account as well. We have Na'ar, or the feminine form, Na'ara, Betula, and Alma. On Na'ar, or more specifically the feminine form, Na'ara, it's interesting to note that at least one lexicon the Muslim website used for the masculine form does not support child as a possible definition for the feminine usage for Rebecca. The Muslim author realizes he can't cite the feminine form of the definition. That would be self-defeating, again. So he justifies using the masculine definition by saying it was later medieval periods that scribes added hey, making na'ar, na'ara, at the end to make a distinction of whether it was speaking about a male or female. Unfortunately, once again, for our Muslim author, the activity he's referring to is proven to have conserved the tradition that the scribes had received. They were not innovators. At best, he is incredibly ignorant 
or perhaps he's deliberately deceptive. Let's look at some other words used for Rebecca. The Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament defines Betula as a grown-up girl in Genesis 24, 16, while Alma is a girl able to be married. Sometimes this term is used of a young woman until the birth of her first child. So the words Na'ar and Na'ara have different nuances, like most words, and the feminine form, Na'ara, can refer to an unmarried woman. Additionally, Abraham, Abraham's servant, and some of Rebekah's family members call her an Isha, which is the typical Hebrew word for woman or wife. It seems reasonable to conclude, given the various nuances of Na'ar and Na'ara, as well as the fact that multiple terms are used to describe Rebekah, that the intent is to portray her as an ideal wife. That is, she's young, she's marriageable, she's also described as attractive, she's the stereotypical wife for someone like Isaac. If the author wanted to portray her as being in her childhood years, he did a very poor job. Genesis 24 gives us some other indications of her age and maturity as well. She came out of the city with her water jar on her shoulder. That's where she met Abraham's servant. She went down to the spring and filled her jar up with water, at which point Abraham's servant spoke to her. She said she would draw water for his camels as well, and she did. Camels can drink up to 25 gallons each. There were 10 of them, but let's say they weren't very thirsty camels, and they only needed 15 gallons each. That's 150 gallons of water. A standard vessel for drawing water in those days was about 2 gallons. That's 75 trips to the well and back. One gallon of water weighs just over 8 pounds, so accounting for the weight of the vessel and 2 gallons of water volume were about 20 pounds, or 9 kilograms if you prefer. So that's about 75 trips to the well and back again, carrying 20 pounds every return trip. And Rebecca, according to Muslims on my channel, was only 3. You can cut those numbers in half, and it still pushes the bounds of reason. You get the point. Rebecca is also old enough to converse with Abraham's servant and make important decisions on her own. This is an interesting contrast with Aisha, whose consent is not asked for. She's simply taken off the swing set, her dolls are with her, and she goes to Muhammad's house for sex. She's explicitly described as prepubescent and immature in Muslim sources. So let's compare. Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her, described as a girl of immature age, was playing on a swing set with her dolls before she was penetrated. Muslim sources explicitly state that she was prepubescent. No mention of her consent is given. Rebecca conversed intelligently with Abraham's servant. She carried a lot of water. She's described with a variety of terms, none of which require her to be a child, and she's responsible enough to make important decisions on her own. The Discover the Truth website relied on rabbinic interpretation and legend, just like the Quran and Hadith. Its arguments are self-defeating, it has inadequate knowledge and analysis of the Hebrew text, and uses inconsistent methodology. Remember that the phrase after these things has to mean two dramatically different things in the same chapter. In the end, all these arguments from Muslims do is show how desperate they are to try to defend their prophet, who has said over and over and over again to have had sex with a nine-year-old girl, and when they can't defend him, they attack the Bible, and in doing so, they show us that they are just as biblically illiterate as their God and prophet were 1,400 years ago. The more things change, the more they stay the same. See you next time. Frequently on my channel, I'm told that Mary was 12 years old when 90-year-old Joseph married her. Or maybe she was 10. She keeps getting younger. Who knows, later this year maybe she'll be nine, like Aisha was when Muhammad had intercourse with her. So where do these claims come from? I'm about to show you a typical example from a Muslim website that is absolutely painful to look at, so I apologize in advance. Oh, that hurts the eyes so much. According to a Catholic encyclopedia, Mary was 12 to 14 when she was married to 90-year-old Joseph. So let's go to that Catholic encyclopedia and see what they say about their sources. The chief sources of information on the life of St. Joseph are the first chapters of our first and third gospels. They are practically the only reliable sources. While the apocryphal literature is full of details, the non-admittance of these works into the canon of sacred books casts a strong suspicion upon their contents. It is in most instances next to impossible to discern and sift these particles of true history from the fancies with which they are associated. Later on the same page, these apocryphal sources, which describe the marriage of Joseph, are called 
unreliable. So the Muslim website points us to the Catholic website, and the Catholic website tells us that the sources the Muslim website is appealing to are unreliable, another testimony to the carelessness of Muslim apologists. Among one of these unreliable sources is the mid to late second century Gospel of James. Bart Ehrman, Muslim's favorite scholar and generally the only one they appeal to, states that the book, referring to the Gospel of James, provides legendary accounts, and one of those is about Mary's marriage as a 12-year-old to Joseph. He says parts of the book rely heavily on the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, but with numerous intriguing expansions, including legendary reports, and he gives some examples. Stephen Davies, who has been working in apocryphal literature for decades, states that the Gospel of James is not a historical account, but a set of legends. Keep in mind that even though the Gospel of James is historically worthless, the Quran barred from it anyway. Ironically then, parts of the Gospel of James and the Apocrypha as a whole became the eternal word of Allah. Funny how that works. But here again, we have the hypocrisy of Muslims on full display. Many of their sources have been considered reliable for centuries, yet now they frequently deny these sources in attempt to defend their religion. How many times do we hear, that Hadith is weak? Meanwhile, they'll base their polemics off of sources that virtually no one considers reliable, like the Gospel of James. Nevertheless, let's examine this Gospel briefly. It says that Mary was 12 years old when she could no longer be allowed to stay in the temple and was taken out to find a husband. She was given to Joseph, who protested because he was an old man. Other sources speculate about what Joseph's age was exactly. Here he's just called an old man. So what's the purpose of this story? Well, one purpose of the Gospel of James is to emphasize the purity of Mary. The baby Mary grew stronger every day, and she actually walked at six months old. She took seven steps, how convenient. Her mother, named Anne, said, you will not walk on the ground again until you walk in the temple of the Lord. Her mother made her bedroom a sacred place and forbade anything common or ritually unclean to come near it. She invited several pure women of Israelite heritage to help raise Mary. So she walks at a mere six months old, and then her feet don't touch the ground again until she's in the temple. That's how clean baby Mary is. Her feet don't even get dirty. She's raised by pure women and taken to the temple later on. But when she's about 12, a problem arises. As she nears puberty, she risks defiling the temple. The chief priest gets some advice from an angel who tells him to assemble the widowers of Israel, that is, men whose wives had died. After they were assembled, a miraculous sign showed that Joseph was selected to be the husband of Mary. The author uses Joseph to further his case for Mary's purity in a couple of ways. Remember what Joseph said. He said he wouldn't marry her because he is old and Mary was just a little girl. Joseph is old and he protests, saying he believes it's inappropriate for such an old man to be married to such a young girl. So Joseph is both physically and mentally inclined to preserve Mary's virginity. Too bad that didn't occur to 50-something-year-old Muhammad before he penetrated nine-year-old Aisha. Mary's virginity is further proven, while Joseph's lack of involvement is further emphasized. During Mary's sixth month of pregnancy, Joseph returned from his trip and discovered that the virgin had grown very visibly pregnant. He said, I took her in as a virgin directly from the temple of God and I have obviously failed to preserve her virginity. Who deceived me? Who did this wicked thing in my house, seducing and defiling the virgin? Mary crying replied, no, I haven't done anything wrong. I never have slept with a man. So you can see how Joseph functions in this story. He believed it was improper for him to be married to someone so young in the first place. He was also concerned about protecting Mary's virginity. Further, in addition to being old, he wasn't even around during Mary's conception, so he couldn't have been involved. Thus, while this gospel does portray an old man being married to a young girl, they are entirely distanced sexually and the narrative only serves to emphasize Mary's purity. This apocryphal story of Joseph and Mary is a stark contrast to Muhammad and Aisha for numerous reasons, not the least of which is that Joseph, unlike Muhammad, knew that an old man shouldn't sleep with a young girl. Now let's see what the Bible says about Mary. First, she is capable of traveling. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, 
from Nazareth to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Here's the approximate route and destination. The trip was about 100 miles and would have taken about three to four days. Not bad for a 12-year-old. While with Elizabeth, she sang her song of praise. This song contains numerous references to the Hebrew Bible, like parallelisms that we find in the Psalms or referring to God as Savior, like we find in the prophets. She alludes to the prayer of Hannah in 1 Samuel, recalling her humble state. In describing her blessings, she recalls Leah's blessing in Genesis 20. She recalls God's might and the great things he had done, as well as his holy name and mercy. More echoes of the Psalms, Prophets, and Torah. The mighty arm of God is used frequently in the Exodus account as well as the prophets. We even have a reference to the servant of Isaiah's prophecies. Numerous Old Testament allusions can be found in just about every line of each verse. Once again, not too bad for a 12-year-old. So, what can we say from the Bible itself, the earliest and most reliable source? Well, Mary is very similar to Rebecca, discussed in a previous video. No specific age is given, but Mary is portrayed as a mature, capable, independent woman. There is nothing in the Bible that suggests impropriety. In fact, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if it wasn't for the laughable polemics Muslims have constructed to distract from the fact that they can't defend their prophet having sex with nine-year-old Aisha, a continuing source of embarrassment for the Muslim community. I'll see you next time.